Hello everybody and welcome to chapter 15. This is Professor Algara with another lecture video. I want you to know that this chapter will be divided into two different videos. So the first one covering impact, momentum and impulse and then the remaining of the chapter will be developed in a second video which will be posted next week. All right, uh, for this first um, lecture I have decided to change uh, the structure of the class. You know, I usually go with what is given by the book, then I give my own explanation, and then we jump into the books. So now I will define with my own words what these topics are, give you a few equations so you can understand what's coming. All right, so let's start with momentum. It is the measurement of the mass in motion. By definition, momentum you will find in the internet that is denoted as the letter P. Obviously, in the book has another denotation, or, or, or it is... Um, name or place as L, but that's something that I don't want to get into. But impulse, I'm sorry, momentum is defined as P equals to MV, where M it's the mass, B is the velocity, and this is the momentum, right? So this is a vector quantity, right? So it's also defined as you relate the vector velocity with the mass, all right? And, and once you define this, it brings me to the second definition, which is impulse. Impulse is a term that is used to describe or quantify the effect of a force acting over a time to change the momentum of an object. So these two are related and impulse is denoted with the letter J and it's like I said, it, it shows you the force applied through an interval of time. So by definition, that's what it is. The units for both of them, okay, it's um, kilograms per meters per second. That will change in the book because I know that the book says that the units for, for um, impulse is Newton second, but if you think about it, the units for force, it's Newton's, right? But Newton's is kilograms per meters over second square. When you multiply that by second, you basically get the same thing. And that's why they both have the same units. And the reason why they both have the same units is because later in the book, later in the video, sorry, we will be developing um, the relationship between impulse and momentum. And as you cannot put oranges and apples in one equation, both of them has to be the same units. Okay, so that's why I want to clarify that because people get confused um, over this. So the, the equation that relates impulse and momentum is described as F delta T will be equals to mass that multiplies B2 minus B1. And this is easily obtained by integrating the equation of motion. You remember what the equation of motion is? We covered that like a while ago. But in case you forgot, sum of forces, it's equals to mass times acceleration. Okay. Once we integrate this respect to time, we will get to the other equation and that's what we're solving you know throughout this lecture video i hope this helps you understand what's coming all right so the method that we're about to solve like i told you it's obtained by integrating the equation of motion with respect to time the result is referred as the principle of impulse and momentum it can be applied to problems involving both linear and angular motion this principle is useful for solving problems that involve force, velocity, and time. As you know, those are the variables that are embedded into the equation. It can also be used to analyze mechanics of impact. So the principle of linear momentum and impulse is obtained by integrating the equation of motion. As you can see here, sum of forces is equal to mass and acceleration. Mass and acceleration can be you know, further developed into mass that multiplies the derivative of velocity respect to time. I don't have to tell you, but we covered back in chapter, in the first chapter of the book, that acceleration it's described as the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. When we take this equation and we integrate on both sides of the equation, we will get something like this. And this equation will take into consideration the time interval, you know, t equals zero all the way to t equals x, you know, x amount of time, and then the velocities at the beginning and at the end. Remember, we're starting 
motion, right? And the motion is usually starting at delta t with velocities. But anyways, this equation represents the principle of linear impulse and momentum. It relates for the particle final velocity and initial velocity and the forces acting on the, par on the particle as a function of time. So linear momentum in the book is denoted as L. I know that at the beginning I showed you a speed, but I'm pretty sure when you go in the internet, that's what you will find. It's okay to have different um, letters for this, but you have to know what those are. You know what I mean? But anyways, this vector has the same direction as V. The linear momentum vector has units equals to kilograms per meters over second, or if you use the IPS system, slog feet over second. So for linear impulse, the linear impulse is the integral, you know, on the other side of, of the equation of motion. Um, is denoted with the letter I. It's a vector quantity measuring the effect of a force during its time interval of action. That's what I just explained to you at the beginning. So as you know, the, the units for this as described in the book, is newtons per second or pounds per second, all right? The impulse might be determined by direct integration, if that's the case, but don't forget that you can also obtain that by getting the area under the curve, okay? So just a reminder for that. So the principle of linear impulse and momentum in vector form, it's basically described with this where this can also describe with the following um, yeah, diagram, right? We've, we've been involved with free body diagrams and kinetic diagrams, so now we're going to uh, be introduced to momentum diagrams and impulse di diagrams. They're very useful for you to visualize what's happening in terms of momentum and, and impulse when, you know, solving exercises and using this as uh, a way to clarify the path that you have to follow in order to to solve one exercise. So, as I told you, those are vector quantities, which means that when you are solving exercises, you might have to um, get each one of the components of these vectors, right? So, as by default, we have x, y, and z, but that's not always the case. What I'm trying to tell you is that most likely, um, when you are solving these kind of equations or these kind of problems, you will have to look at them from the X, Y, and Z perspective. Don't forget that because that's very important. And again, problem solving for this, it's just like kind of a recipe that you should follow at least for the first exercises before you master your abilities. But anyways, at first you need to establish the X, Y, and Z coordinate system. Then you should draw uh, the particles free body diagram to, to establish the direction of the particles, initial and final velocities. And also after that, you have to develop the impulse and, moment, and momentum diagrams for the particle. Like I said, this is very useful for you to visualize your plan. Okay, then we need to resolve the forces and velocity, uh, you know, into X, Y, and Z components and then apply the principle of linear impulse and momentum using the scalar forms. Okay, forces a function of time, you know, sometimes that could happen. You're not giving the forces by a number, you're giving the forces by functions of time. When that happens, you must integrate to obtain those values. Okay, this is just a reminder how to um, treat an exercise with mathematical equations and like like always let's just solve our first exercise very simple one to kind of see uh, what we just explained but anyways giving a 0.5 kilogram bolt strikes through a rough ground and then rebounds with the velocities shown you know right here we have to neglect okay the bolts weight during the time it impacts the ground and then we need to find the magnitude of impulse force exerted by the ball okay so the first step for me would be to you know my x y and c in this case i don't have x i don't have z only x y and you can establish that you know in your head as you wanted it so it could be you know y and x if you do the other way and you get negative value it means that you basically establish the wrong coordinate system and it shouldn't have any impact on your calculations if you keep track 
of that coordinate system. But anyways, then after that, we know that we need to use the equation, the impulse equation. So if we use that relationship, we know that M that multiplies B1 plus the sum of the integral of the forces or the impulse, right? Force dt should be equals to mass velocity 2. And if we do that with this, we should be able to draw our impulse momentum di diagrams, right? So I have the ball at first, and this ball will have some momentum, right? We have to start talking with the proper um, terms. And this has an angle of theta, which is equal to 45 that it's given. And then all the forces that calls impulse into the particle. So I have the particle now. And at the moment of impact, right, I have an impulse force. And I'm going to call that F dt or the integral of F dt. And I also have the normal force which is also the integral, right, of the normal force, dt, and the integral of the way dt, right? We can neglect these two things. They are equal. It, it goes into the same um, direction, and they will be equal and opposite. So because of that, I can neglect this to and don't take them into consideration for my calculations, but that's not the only reason. Also, the impact exerted by the ball will be so um, greater than, than the interactions that you have with the weight that we can neglect them. But it was also given on the statement. And then this is equals to the impulse that was given at the end, right? And I like to and I like to look at this as an equation that relates initial and final conditions, just as we did with kinetic and potential energy in the previous chapter, right? So if you want to think about it, um, this is the momentum that you had at the beginning plus the forces of impulse will tell you the momentum at the end. And that's the analysis that you need to have when solving these exercises. Everything can be solved as an, as an energy balance, you know? Some cases will be, you know, thermal energy, kinetic energy, potential energy. But if you have all of this energy at the beginning plus whatever uh, mechanical phenomenon happens, then that should tell you what happens at the end. And I want you to, to think about that because you will be using that not only this class but also thermodynamics, you know, and so on and so forth. So if I type in the, in the equations, I will get that, you know, mass uh, that multiplies uh, velocity 1 will be equals to 0 0.5, right? That multiplies the velocity. The velocity 1 is given, which is 25, and I need a component on the x direction, which has to be multiplied by the cosine of 45, right? In the i direction, minus 25 sine of 45 in the j direction, okay? That plus force dt and i'm going to stop calling that force dt and i'm going to start calling this by its name which is impulse right and that's what i need to calculate will be equals to mass 0 0.5 that multiplies b2 which is also given it will be 10 cosine of 30 in the i direction plus 10 sine of 30 in the j direction. With this, all I have to do is to solve this equation, solve for i. And then, when I solve this equation, I will get that i, or the impulse, will be equal to 4.509 in the i direction plus 11.34 in the j direction. And please do not forget your units. All right? And if you want, obviously, they ask you for the magnitude. If they ask you for the magnitude of impulse, how do you get the, magni the magnitude of a vector? Usually in a class, I will 
be expecting an answer. But the magnitude of a vector is just the square root of its components, you know, each component to the square, the sum of all of that, that's how you get it. So impulse will be equals to the first components, the first component, which is the x direction. It's five point, um, I'm sorry, 4.509 that goes to the square plus the second component, which is 1134 to the square, square root of all that, and that give me a value of 12.2 newtons second. And that's it, all right? If you think about it, what I did, I used what I explained at the beginning. I used the principle of linear impulse and momentum, and I was able to get what it was asked of me. So now we're going to briefly discuss about the impulse and momentum of a system of particles. So basically what we do with a system of particles is what we've been doing from statics, you know. Um, basically we need to zoom all of those masses and multiply that by the velocity or a common velocity and then that will also be um, summarized to the sum of forces that cause the impulse and then that will be equals to all of these masses, all of them com combined, multiplied by the final velocity. Okay, very easy. It's basically what we've been cover from the beginning. When you when you want to study the motion of the center of mass, and this is very useful when you have like a like an object with um with a really weird shape and you want to study that. Sometimes you divide that by nodes and each node will represent one particle and as you combine all of them you can study the system but for this you have to define a fictitious center of mass you know which is basically all that mass total and then you have to summarize all those mass and multiply by the initial velocity in order to get you know the following equation the motion of this fictitious mass is based on the motion of the center of mass of the system that's the whole thing once you get like a, um, it's an average of all of them and you divide that by the mass total that will give you um, the ability to describe the movement okay like i said very simple because that's that's just a few uh, terms that we need for what's coming, which is the conservation of linear momentum for a system of particles. When you have a system of particles and there's no forces, you know, causing um, impulse, then the momentum is conserved. The momentum is only transferred from one mechanical component to another, okay? Or if you're starting two particles in motion, instead of having forces that will help that movement, um, we don't have that and therefore the momentum is conserved. Okay, when the sum of external impulse acting on a on a system of object is zero, like I said, there's no forces causing impulse, then the linear momentum equation simplifies to this impulse momentum equation. This lean this equation is referred as the conservation of linear momentum. Okay, conservation of momentum is often applied when particles collide or interact. If you take a look at this picture, right, as, as the hammer is hitting the nail, what we're doing, we're using all of this momentum and transferring the momentum into this to perform a mechanical phenomenon. Okay, so it's just exactly the same equation or very similar to the equation that we had in previous chapter when we were um, conservating, conserv we were conserving the energy um, as potential and kinetic energy in both states, okay? When we didn't have any work causing work. If I can, you know, reach out to the previous chapter, I would ask you to because it's very useful. But anyways, this is the conservation of momentum is when you transfer that momentum onto another particle, okay? And I want to use an example for that. So we have this system, right? Um, basically... We have block A, block B. So at the beginning, they're not together. Then, um, you know, block B will interact with block A. They will get in contact. And once they get in contact, they will start compressing this little spring. And then they're asking us the maximum compression of the spring. And I like these kind of exercises because not because they're useful. It's just like it forced you to use what you have learned into this. And I like not what the book solution is, 
but more than that is the analysis that you can give to these exercises. So let's see what the book says. The book says that we can consider both blocks as a single system and apply the conservation of linear momentum, which is what just what was just explained, to find the velocity after the impact but before the spring compresses. Then use the energy conservation to find the compression of the spring. When I see an exercise like this, I, I don't start with this plan. I always start with what, what is asked of me. They're asking me for the maximum compression of the spring, which means basically they're asking me for um, potential energy. You remember back in the previous chapter, right? We were studying that potential energy was all was only exerted by uh, the compression or extension of a spring and also the weight as it changed in the y direction, right? So if you have that fresh in your mind, that should help you understand what is needed and what you will do because this plan, it's never given, right? Your exercise will start in here and get up to this point. And it's very important that we have a good analysis in order to solve these exercises. So when I see something like this, right, I, I, what I always do is to see what is given. So for me, uh, the K of the spring is given, which is 10 kilonewtons per meters. Pay attention to this, right? Um, the mass of A, it's equals to 15 kilograms. BA is not moving, right? When they're not together. Then MB is 10 kilograms. MVV, it's 15 meters per second. They're asking me the final compression coming from S0 coming from S, S0 or S dot, right? So like I said, when I see that and only conservative forces are applied, right? Remember that there are only conservative forces involved. Therefore, there's nothing else causing work and I can use the principle of conservation of energy that we study, um, you know, last, last chapter, which states that T1 plus B1, it's equals to T2, plus B2, potential and kinetic energy. The good thing with this is when I look at this as a whole, as a system, right? I don't have potential energy because, why? Because the spring is not compressed. Therefore, you know, it's one half KS squared, S is zero. Therefore, my V1 is zero. My T1, it's um, used when the velocity, when the initial velocity is given, right? And it's MB to the square divided by two. And when it comes to zero, when I need to calculate the maximum compression of the spring, which is, like I said, one half KS square, I will need to use when that happens. When is the, is the spring going to be fully compressed? When these two things stop moving, right? When B comes in contact with A, it keeps moving until both of them stop. That will be the maximum compression, which means that it has to be when T2 is zero. Because if it's mass times velocity to the square divided by two, that means that this guy has to be zero. That will simplify my equation to you know a lot, right? What I need to know for this, the velocity that we have at the beginning of this movement, right? And that's when I can use the conservation of momentum. When I, see, when I look at the exercise and I keep going back and forth, I will realize that I can use this as a system, right? And as a system, when I zoom all of those masses and I multiply that uh, by the velocity, I can see that at t equals zero, then, then a few times after that, they are both together, and then the third time will be when they're compressed. So between this state and the state in which they are fully in contact, I will use the conservation of momentum. And between they are in contact and they go together to compress the spring, I will use the conservation of energy. So it's very important for us to see the different stages in the exercise. Like I said, stage number one, they're not in contact. Stage number two, they come in contact. And stage number three, they keep in contact and they compress the spring. When you have that in your head, it's very simple to perform the equations. Like I said, 
my f this is basically what I need at the end, so I need to start defining what I have at the beginning. So I will use the conservation of linear momentum equation, which is sum of all the masses that multiplies the initial velocity will be equals to sum of all the masses that multiplies the final velocity. And that's what, what I'm looking for, you know, V2, because this V2 will be the first velocity for the third part, you know? So if I start rewriting this equation, I will be it will be MA VA because they're not in contact plus MB VV. And this is at the beginning, right? And then for the second one, I can zoom because they're now together. I can zoom both masses and then multiply that by a velocity at the end. What you need to realize is that at the beginning, MA is not moving. So I only have MB that multiplies velocity B. And this is given, right? It was 10. It's right here. The mass of B is 10. The velocity is 15 going in the opposite direction. So that will be minus 15. And these multiply to the sum of both masses, which is 10 plus 15, and that's 25. And this multiply V2. If I solve for V2, I get that V2 is equal to minus 6 meters per second. This is the final velocity between the first stage. So now I take this into the third stage as this is the first velocity, right? That's what I was looking for. So if I keep going up with going on with my plan, I will get that the total mass that multiplies that velocity or B1, right? Let's call it B1 or B2, that's what we call, or let's call B dot, right? To the square divided by two will be equals to one half K that multiplies S max. To the square guys it's very simple right because i have the total mass is 25 and then i have the velocity that i just calculated which is minus 6 divided by 2 and this is equals to one half to the k and don't forget and this is what i need you need to be to pay attention it's 10 kilonewtons but if i'm consistent with my with my units i need to place this in terms of newtons right 10,000 that multiplies s max to the square. With this, I only need to solve for s max and then s max will be equals to 0 0.3 meters. And this is the max compression, right? Please check my math but I'm pretty sure I did everything as I supposed to. What I want you to remember from this exercise is the following, guys. As we move in dynamics, we have to use everything. And this class is so important because when you get into the next class, you will have to use everything that was learned in this whole class. You know, chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I use the conservation of energy principle that we learned last, you know, last chapter, and I use it to develop and combine that with what I just learned. It's very important that you do that you make assumptions based on knowledge. If you make the right assumptions based on the right knowledge, then you will get your answers with no problem. Okay, and I stop and I spend so much time on these kind of exercises because it shows how you can apply the knowledge into getting the numbers needed. All right. Okay. And finally, we'll be covering impact. All right. Impact occurs when two bodies collide during a very short time period, causing large impulse forces to be exerted between the bodies. Common examples of impact, like I said, is when we were talking about a hammer and a nail or, you know, a ball, a bat striking a ball. The line of impact is a line this is very important. A life of impact is aligned through the mass centers, as you can see here, right, to the mass centers of the colliding particles. In general, there are two types of impact. The easy one is central impact. It occurs when the directions of motion of the two colliding particles are along, along the line of impact, as you can see here. And then the oblique impact occurs when the direction of motion is one 
of one or both particles is at an angle to the line of impact, as you can see here, right? And this is the line of impact. Perfect. Central impact happens when the velocities of the objects are along the line of impact, like we just said, right, right here. And once the particles contact, they might deform if they're non-rigid. In any case, energy is transferred between the, the two particles. There are two primary equations when solving impact problems. In most problems, the initial velocities of the particles are known, and it's necessary to find the final velocity. So that's why you might need two equations. The first equation is a conservation of linear motion. You know, one particle transfers the momentum to the other one, and, and, and the momentum is conserved. So this provides one equation, but we need to find another equation in order to solve this system of unknowns. A new term is now developed, which is named as the coefficient of restitution. Coefficient of restitution is the ratio of the particles' relative separation velocities after impact and the two particles' relative approach velocities before the impact. The coefficient of restitution is also an indicator of the energy lost during the impact. The equation defining the coefficient of restitution E is described as follow, in which you have particle A and B final velocities and particle A and B initial velocities. If a value for E is specified, which is most likely what happens, this relation provides a second equation necessary to solve your unknowns. Okay? So, in, in, in general terms, you will have different scenarios. So, when E is equal to 1, you have something that is called elastic impact. In a perfect elastic collision, no energy is lost, and the relative separation velocities, velocity equals the relative approach velocity of the particles. In practical situations, this condition is never achieved. You know, this is not a, uh, this is like a perfect scenario but it cannot be achieved. In plastic impact, in a plastic impact, the relative separation velocity is zero, the particles stick together and move with a common velocity after the impact. Some values uh, of E are when they are colliding steel on steel, wood on wood, lead on lead, and glass on glass. Okay, those are common values that are tabulated, you know, by default. Okay, so energy losses. This is very simple. Okay, so once the particles' velocities before be, velocities before and after the collisions have been determined, the energy lost during the collision can be calculated on the basis of the difference in particles' kinematic energy. Okay, so basically we have to measure the kinetic energy at the end, the kinetic energy at the beginning, and that relationship will tell us exactly how much energy was lost. Okay, during a collision, some of the particles' initial kinetic energy will be lost in the form of heat, sounds, or due to localized deformation. So this is the tough one, oblique impact. Okay, so the first one, the central impact, is it was like a straightforward, but this one is not as straightforward as the other one. In an oblique impact, one or both particles in motion, the velocities are at an angle with a line of impact. Typically, there, there will be four unknowns, the magnitudes and directions of the final velocity. The four equations required to solve the unknowns are conservation of momentum and the coefficient of restitution equations along the line of axis. What we need to know with this is something very important, guys. We will have in both the line of impact and the line that is perpendicular to the line of impact. These two are very important because when you have a line of impact, in this case is x, it will not be that case all the time, but when you have a line of impact, the axis that is perpendicular to that line of impact in that axis, your momentum will be conserved. And that will provide you with an equation to solve the exercises. Then we will use also the E equation, you know, the, co the coefficient of restitution, and then you will also use um, your conservation of momentum, okay, in the line of action. Those two, those four equations will help you detect or determine the unknowns that you have for such exercises. Procedure for analysis, okay? In most cases involving these impact problems, the initial velocities of the particles and the coefficient of restitutions are known, and we need to calculate 
the final velocity. That's usually the case, but not all the not all the time. What you have to know about this particular one is that you will have unknowns and you will have variables, right? That are known. You will you should always have the same numbers of unknowns versus the number of equations. If you don't, then you need to find an equation through the knowledge that you have learned until now. Assumptions based on knowledge. Don't forget that. Define the x and y axis. Typically, the x axis is defined along the line of impact and the y axis is the plane of contact perpendicular to the axis. For both central and oblique impact problems, the following equations apply along the line of impact. And then for oblique impact problems, you know, the following equations are required and we need to apply and use the line perpendicular to the line of impact so we can see where the moment is conserved. Okay, don't forget that because this one right here, it's quite important. And we have an exercise. So the ball will hit the wall, right? Right here. And then we need to calculate the velocities as it bounces from the wall. Okay? Not that hard. The good thing with this is that the ball will not move. I'm, I'm sorry. The wall will not move. Therefore, those velocities will remain zero. So it's very easy. And then it will rebound from the wall going into BB2, we need to calculate BB2 and the angle in which it's exerted. What we need to know is that locate the line of impact, you know, that's my line of impact, and then the Y direction will be the one perpendicular to the impact. And why is that important? Because I'm just following the procedure for analysis that I just described. In the, in the line perpendicular to the line of impact, we can get that the moment is conserved and that will give me the first equation. Since, you know, the wall is not moving, this will simplify my calculations so fast, okay? So what I need to know is that, you know, uh, the line perpendicular to the line of action, the moment is conserved, which means that the y direction, that's a y direction, right? So MB, or, or the mass of the ball that multiplies BB, Y, at 1 will be equals to the mass of the ball that multiplies BB2 or BBY2. If we um, if we know that, that's what we need, and that will give me one equation. The second equation that will that I will use will be the coefficient of restitution along the line of action. In this case, will be E will be equals to the mass of the first, right? Because that that's what is important. The thing that hits and the second object, right? In this equation, this one right here, it will it was established as object A and object B. We need to take that into our equation because our object uh, B will be the wall, object A will be the ball, right? So let's just call N wall and M ball, right? So B of the wall at the begin at the end minus B of the ball at the end over B of the ball at the beginning minus B of the wall at the end. What we know is that this guy is zero and this guy is also zero, right? So those should be enough for me to find my own knowns. So I'm going to use the first one, which is this, right? For this one, I have that the mass of B, which is given, if I'm not mistaken, right? All right, so masses are the same. They cancel out, right? So if I rewrite this equation, BBY2, it's equals to 10 meters per second, okay? I will use the second equation, which is E, zero minus b of the ball in the x direction line of action at the end minus b velocity of the ball okay if i plug into the values that i have right all of them i will get that 0 0.75 it's equals to zero minus minus b bv2 right which i don't know cosine of theta over 20 cosine of 30 
minus zero. If I solve these whole equations for v, v2, cosine of theta, I will get that this is equals to 12.99 meters per second. Previously calculated bv2 sine of 30, that is equals to 10 meters per second. That's what I got from the previous calculation. What I need you to realize is that I'm just calculating the y direction and the x direction of bv2, right? And if that's what you realize as well, then you will know that the vector or the vectorial form of this will be equals to, right? And that's what you get for your vector velocity. If you need to find the magnitude of that vector, it's just the square root of 12.99 to the square plus 10 to the square. And that will give you a value of 16.4 meters per second, right? So what we need to calculate now, it's the angle. Well, angle is very simple, right? the angle theta it's equals to the inverse tangent of y over x which is 10 over 12.99 when I solve this I get 37.6 perfect and then remember that v v2 was calculated as 16.4 meters per second and that's how I solve the exercise so what matters here, as a little recap, is that we identify at the beginning x and y, and then furthermore, we also identify the line of action and the plane that is perpendicular to the line of action, so we can use the equations as we learn. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, we're going to cover the remaining of the chapter in, an, in the next lecture video, which will be posted next week. I hope you like it. Please don't forget to leave me a like or a comment. You know, I really appreciate that. And thank you very much for watching my lectures. I will see you in the next video. Thank you.